l'Université de Lausanne, euh, notamment en charge de, de la valorisation de l'enseignement. Donc je suis euh, extrêmement heureux aujourd'hui qu'on puisse organiser ce, ce workshop avec vous. Et j'aimerais vous souhaiter la, la bienvenue euh, au nom des trois organisations qui ont mis sur pied cette, cette, cette journée. Euh, la, la HESSO, ça va être un exercice d'articulation. Le, le SFDN, qui est le Swiss Faculty Development Network, qui regroupe l'ensemble des conseillers et conseillères pédagogiques des hautes écoles suisses. Et euh, évidemment, l'Université de, de Lausanne. Alors, vous... Je voudrais aussi, avant d'oublier, remercier euh, le comité d'organisation de, de, euh, de cette journée, en particulier euh, Nathalie Cheny, qui doit être quelque part par là, Ingrid Leduc, Emmanuel Sylvestre, et, et souligner aussi l'implication d'Ariane Dumont, qui a initié cette, euh, cette journée. Je les remercie toutes et tous euh, beaucoup, et bien sûr tous ceux qui, qui nous aident, euh, euh, les gens du NICOM, Loïc, etc., pour, pour cette journée. Alors vous qui êtes là, vous intéressez aux questions d'enseignement et d'apprentissage depuis un certain nombre d'années et donc vous êtes très au fait sur l'importance d'impliquer les étudiants dans l'enseignement et dans, dans l'apprentissage. Donc on n'a pas besoin de vous convaincre là-dessus, vous savez que c'est important mais vous savez aussi que ce n'est pas toujours facile d'inciter des collègues à, à, à changer de paradigme comme on dit dans les livres, c'est un changement très important malgré tout. Et donc, euh, je suis vraiment très, très heureux que nous puissions avoir aujourd'hui la, la présence d'Éric Mazur, qui est un des, un des pionniers de l'apprentissage coopératif, ou Peer Instruction. Et euh, avec un, un degré supplémentaire, c'est que c'est aussi un, un expert, si on veut, du Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, puisque à, à travers son travail, il a vraiment essayé d'avoir une, une étude très systématique et... et comme une recherche sur les questions d'enseignement et d'apprentissage pour faire évoluer son apprentissage. Et bien sûr, c'est ce que nous tous espérons qui se développe pour faire évoluer l'enseignement le, supérieur. Voilà, vous n'êtes pas venu pour m'écouter, donc je ne vais pas m'attarder trop longtemps. J'ai euh, l'immense plaisir de vous de présenter Eric Mazur, qui, comme vous le savez, je ne vais pas raconter 15 000 choses, est professeur de, de physique à, à Harvard. Et Balkansky, professeur de physique, c'est ça ouais. je... <rire> je me suis entraîné et puis hier soir. Et euh, on est vraiment très, très content que de pouvoir profiter de cette expérience et de partager avec vous. Et comme je l'ai dit, il est, il est expert de, de ces choses. Il est extrêmement à l'aise en français, donc ceux qui souhaiteraient plutôt poser des questions en français, surtout ne vous gênez pas. The floor is yours. Merci. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry for switching in English, but um, even though French is my mother tongue, c'est ma langue maternelle, it would be really difficult for me to give a professional talk in, uh, in French. But as you heard, please ask your questions in French if, uh, if that's easier for you. Okay, so I had a little bit of a problem putting this workshop together because in principle it should come after the talk that I am going to give at, uh, what is it, 11 o'clock. Um, because basically what I would like to present is the platform that we are using to um, teach interactively and, uh, and use this first one and a half hour to, uh, to demonstrate that with you as the students. Um, however, The pedagogy is really more important than the technology. I will make that point again this afternoon. Uh, most uses of technology in education, in my view, are simply old wine in new bottles. Right? I mean, why would PowerPoint be a better way of transferring information than the blackboard or an overhead projector or anything else? Why would moving a lecture to the internet Be better. We'll talk more about that uh, in the second presentation. Why would that be better than a, or worse than a, than a live lecture? I think that the use of technology in education sh should pass through a very strict filter. And the filter is very simple. It's, can you do this without technology? If the answer is yes, then don't expect any mir miracles. Ideally, the use of technology affords a new mode of learning. 
something that cannot be done without the use of uh, technology. Anyway, let me take a few minutes um, to um, give you a little bit of a background. I will first give you the message that I'm going to give in my second talk, which is really a message about the lecture. Uh, I will not give you any detail, because the detail is going to come in, in my second presentation at 11. Then I will very briefly discuss peer instruction for those of you who are not familiar with it. I will not demonstrate it, will not actually do it, because that again will be in the second presentation. And then we'll finally here get to something that we won't get to this afternoon, or the, the, later this morning, namely peer instruction 2.0, quote unquote, which is um, what I'm uh, going to focus on this morning. So the key message this morning in, 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 the, in the bigger colloquium is, you know, what, what is it that is actually happening in a lecture? This is a picture of me teaching. I show it in almost all of my talks in education, uh, a lecture to pre-medical students many, many years ago. Um, and um, you could ask yourself, what is it that is actually happening in that classroom, which is not very different from this classroom, which is not very different from learning spaces all over the world, which is not very different from the Greek amphitheater developed several thousand years ago. The Greek were smart enough not to use a space like that for teaching. They used it for performances. Um, if you've ever seen a, a picture of the school of Athens, you don't see people sit in an amphitheater. You see people walk in pairs and talk. I guess the instruction is really an old idea. You know, after all, Socrates already said you should teach by, uh, by questioning. Anyway, the reality all around the globe is that 99.9% .9 of all teaching takes place that way, this way. Right? And if you ask yourself, what is it that is actually happening there? I think I'll give this a little bit more meat uh, later on this morning is that, by the way, it's not that I've already told you my message, be silent when I ask the audience uh, in the second <laughs> talk. <laughs> To, uh, to give me feedback on, uh, on, I'll basically pose the question. But essentially, the lecture is a process which focuses on the transfer of information. And given the fact that we teach this way all around the globe, you could ask yourself, is that what education is? Is education simply the transfer of information? I don't think so, and I hope you will agree. I think that there's much more. The learner has to do something with that information that is being transferred. In any case, I will show uh, later this morning that the result of focusing on simply the transfer of information is a lack of learning. I'll show that even my Harvard students were not able to conceptually grasp what I tried to teach them in week one by the end of the semester. And I'll show you data, because I, I realize that in education, you know, a lot of statements get made which are anecdotal. And as you heard in the introduction, we really should be scholarly about our approach to teaching, just as we are about our, our disciplines. The other one is a lack of retention. My colleague, psychologist Skinner, once said, education is all that is left when everything that is learned is forgotten. And there's actually a deep truth to that statement. I think that there are very few things I remember from all the courses I took as a student, as a high school uh, student. And it's a sad statement, too, right? We'll do a little exercise um, after the break, reflecting on our education, and you will see that the things that are really important in life, you don't learn them in a setting like this. The other point, which I will not illustrate with data, uh, even in the, the second part of my presentation, is lack of retention. Lack of retention of students in majors, especially in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics majors. At Harvard, for example, 50% of the students 
who enroll at Harvard express an interest in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. Maybe only 15% graduates with a degree in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. So we do a very good job turning off that initial interest that there is in these uh, fields. But that's not the only problem with retention. The other problem with retention is how much people remember of the material that they've learned. And as this quote from Skinner illustrates, most people forget everything that they have learned. And studies that have been done about retention of knowledge and retention of skills are, uh, are rather uh, disappointing. So that's the premise. And again, I realize that I'm making here a lot of statements that might feel very loaded without showing any data. You have to forgive me for uh, keeping you in suspense for the data, but I will show data and I will uh, articulate these ideas a little bit better uh, later on. Otherwise, we can't get to learning catalytics and have fun. So after I discovered this problem in my classroom and my confessions, which are coming later, actually uh, describe the transformation from being a, a, a lecturer to, um, to somebody who teaches interactively. After I made that transition, I started basically teaching by questioning rather than by telling. So I see education now as a two-step process. One, transfer of information. After all, without transfer of information, you can't even begin, right? So you do need that transfer of information. But that's not all. We shouldn't stop there. The second part is that the learner needs to do something with that information, make sense of the information. I wrote down assimilation of information. For those of you who are familiar with Piaget, Piaget would probably call this accommodation rather than, than assimilation. Right? You need to, to, to build a mental framework to extract from that information that is being transferred the knowledge that allows you to apply uh, whatever you've learned into a new context. So much of education, I'm going to make this point again later this morning, is the instructor delivering information to the students. You wait one or two months. Then you put the students in a room like this, but you make sure that they're all separated from one another so they can't communicate. You also tell them to put their computers and cell phones and books and notes and everything away. They're only allowed to carry a pencil, a calculator without a memory and an eraser. And you get them to regurgitate the same information back to the instructor. And then we're surprised that they're unable to solve real problems or to transfer their knowledge from one context to another. And that is because that second step actually has not taken place. Now, in the standard approach to teaching, all of the emphasis is on the transfer of information. And the assimilation, where does that happen? I've asked myself often, where did that happen for me? Did it happen while I was sitting in a classroom like this, listening to my instructors? I don't think so. I think it happened outside of class. When I went over the notes, I went, oh, yes, no, I get it. The aha moments, the making sense. Now, if you ask yourself which of these two steps is easy and which is hard, I think we all agree step one is the easy part. Step two is the hard part, especially now we are in an information age. So it's kind of ironic that in the standard approach to teaching, we put all of the emphasis on the easy part and expect the hard part to happen on its own as it did for us. But we became academics. Most of our students are not going to become academics. They're not going to have the same interest. Is it reasonable to expect that the same, you know, aha outside of the class will, will occur on its own? I think not. I think it would make much more sense to focus in education on that second step, to use this precious time that we have face to face with students to focus on that second step. 
And we better do that because in a certain sense, information, I mean, uh, universities are at a crossroad in the information age, right? If we don't focus on that second step, I think we might very well soon find ourselves out of a job because massive online courses, I mean, moving lectures to the internet is going to take care of that first part. So my proposal, a very simple one, is to invert this sequence. And the term that is being used a lot now is the flipped classroom. That came actually from K-12 education. I think it's a, a great term. I never thought of it. I always use the word invert. So rather than doing one in class and two out of class, we should do one out of class and two in class. Rather than have the homework after class, let's put it before and have students either read the book or watch a lecture so that in class we can work on making sense of the reading or the watching or whatever else they have done before coming to class. So I'd like to focus very briefly on that step two and we'll do that in much more detail uh, in the second part of my talk. This is just to set you up for learning catalytics here. Um, what do you do to help students make sense of the information? Well, I teach by questioning rather than by telling. Again, nothing really new. Socrates, thousands of years already said that's what we should do. So I walk into class and talk a few minutes, ask a question. I give students time to think about that question on their own without talking to their uh, neighbors. Then I poll them. Initially, we did that by a show of hands. No technology. I just had the students put their hand on their chest with the number of fingers showing the choice. So there were multiple choice questions. One, two, three, and so on, up to five. And uh, after they've all committed to an answer, I tell them, turn to your neighbor and try to convince your neighbor of your answer. That's the heart of peer instruction. That's where the students start teaching one another. And um, I will motivate a little bit better this, uh, later this morning why the approach works. Um, but typically, the number of correct responses increases very uh, dramatically. I poll them again, and I explain, and the cycle basically repeats until the end of class time. And of course, the learning, this, the second step, this assimilation of information takes place uh, during that discussion when students are essentially teaching one another. It's not that I don't do anything during that time. I will walk around and listen into the discussion and semi-Socratically try to lead them uh, to the right answer. Okay, so that's the premise. And again, you know, it's basically a very short summary of what I will um, explain in, in much greater detail after the break. I want to focus today on the feedback because a very essential part of uh, peer instruction is the feedback from the students to the instructor. When I started, there were no clickers. In the second part of, uh, of my presentation this morning, we'll use the little clickers. What are they called again in French? Zapet? Uh, yeah, right. So um, we'll use those. They were developed as a consequence of peer instruction becoming uh, popular. Initially, I just, as I said, had a show of hands. But that feedback from the students to the instructor is very important. So in 1991, the first year that I implemented peer instruction, I used a show of hands. And then in 1993, uh, with a grant, a large grant from the National Science Foundation, we had this wired network of HP calculators. It was beautiful. Students would log in, just as you did with your smart devices a moment ago. And, um, and I had a seating map, so I knew exactly, oh, that's Pierre there, that's uh, Francoise there. You know, I, I knew exactly where every student was, uh, was seated. Uh, but the problems were, one, it was excessively expensive, right? I mean, these were, what, a few hundred dollars per student. It was wired. We bought them for the students. 
had, uh, there was a network in the, in the, in the classroom with a uh, jack at each seat. And at the end of the class, some students would just walk up, forget to unplug their devices, walk away, rip the whole jack out. I mean, the maintenance, and, and it, it was very, very complex. Uh, five years later, an alum of what is now the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard, who had a factory in Hong Kong, fabricated the first infrared clicker, PRS. Some of you may have seen it. It's a museum piece now. It doesn't use RF protocol. It uses infrared, which is not very good when you have large numbers of uh, students. Fast forward 10 years, and now there's a veritable zoo of different clickers. And in the process, something curious happened. All of a sudden, it all became about the technology. People would adopt the clickers because they liked the clickers, not because they thought about the pedagogy. In fact, some people would come to me and say, oh, I've adopted uh, your clicker technique. It would make me mad. The first reason it would make me mad was because to me it was not the technology, it was the pedagogy. But much more important, I failed to commercialize it myself. So I felt that I had sort of missed <laughs> the boat there. And you know, what also happened was that many faculty started to use it in what I considered inappropriate ways. I do some analysis of uh, the Twitter feeds. If you do a search on Twitter on the words class and clicker, you get an interesting look into the minds of the students. And you can actually analyze how faculty around the world use clickers. Some use them for attendance as a way of forcing students to come to class. Others use it simply as, you know, they still give a standard lecture, and in the middle of the lecture, they stop, and they project the question, which of the following is not a living being? A giraffe, a rock, a butterfly. And students click two, and they go back to sleep immediately afterwards. The instructor says, that's right, and continues to lecture. No learning, no, nothing really interesting. And in the many workshops that I gave, I noticed that the real question, questions, plural, that faculty have are, how do I design good questions? Right? Because that's the key. You need to design the questions to engage the minds of the students, not to make sure that they're awake or sitting in class or whatever. How do I optimize the discussions Right? It's that interaction between the students when they talk to each other that is crucial because that's when the learning takes place. How do I optimize that? Because the way people are seated, I'm sure that if you came from Zurich, you're probably sitting next to somebody else from Zurich. If you came from uh, Yverdon, same thing. Right? You tend to sit next to the people you know, even though, let's face it, you came here to learn new things, not only from me, but also from the other people here. So in hindsight, it might have been a lot better if you had taken a seat next to somebody you did not know. However, you know, we're kind of shy social beings, so we tend to stay in our comfort zone and sit next to people we do know. Students are like that too. And they often form groups that are not optimal. In fact, far from optimal, right? So if you just let the students sit wherever they want and talk to whomever they want, there's no guarantee that they will actually learn effectively. How do you manage time, right? Uh, teaching with peer instruction is much more chaotic than me just talking like I'm doing now and controlling the, the activity in the classroom. How long do you let them think? How long do you let them talk to each other? So that prompted me to um, start developing learning catalytics together with um, a colleague in the statistics department, Gary King. He is a statistician and uh, a social scientist. But the reason that I hooked up with him were two. One is we do mountain biking together, so we get to chat a lot. But it turns out that he has a company called Crimson Hexagon, that does uh, cluster analysis of social media. By basically looking at Twitter feeds, 
he can predict all kinds of trends. In the elections in 2008, for example, in the United States, he was able to predict the outcome of the election on the day of the elections before any exit polls in the morning, simply because people went to vote and then tweeted about their, their feelings. He can do analysis for companies predicting trends and, 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 and uh, that company took off. And then I, I, when I heard about how his company uh, did and what the algorithms are that they use to do this analysis, I thought analyzing a Twitter feed is not that different from analyzing free text response. It'd be great if we could take not multiple choice questions, but just open-ended questions that somehow make sense of the information that uh, comes back. And then the third founding partner of Learning Catalytics is um, a postdoc of mine, uh, Brian Lukoff, who, who obtained his PhD in, um, in education at Stanford and then came to work for me. And his work at Stanford was done on another crucial missing part of the puzzle for me, and that was on interpreting visual information. He got his thesis, thesis showing that he could computer grade draw trained human beings. So you can have students draw a parabola and have the machine score the accuracy of that drawn uh, parabola. So we got together and we thought we're going to develop a platform that uses consumer technology. Why force students to buy clickers if they all have intelligent devices like a tablet or a laptop or a smartphone. Just a few days ago, the number of smartphones in the world passed the one billion mark. It was just this week, I think. So one billion people on the planet have smartphones, of course, mostly in the West and countries like yours and, um, and mine. So why have people buy some device that only has one function, namely voting in the classroom. Let's use consumer devices. And then you just use intelligent algorithms to improve the questioning, to manage the discussion, and to facilitate the time management and flow. So let's start with a big, big problem of clickers. They're essentially multiple choice, right? I mean, if you take a clicker, you can only press A, B, C, D. That means you have to use multiple choice questions. But Multiple choice questions are incredibly difficult to develop, right? You have a question. As the expert, you know, hopefully, the right answer. But it's very difficult to come up with a plausible wrong answer. And most multiple choice questions, or many, I shouldn't say most, many, can be answered simply by elimination, not by actually real thinking. So what we did is we developed an extensible plugin architecture for many different uh, question types. And some of them are shown here. And we'll, we'll try them out in the, next, uh, in the next hour or so. But in order to do that, we all have to get online. Okay? So what I would like you to do is take your device. I'm gonna, we're going to pause here for a few minutes until everybody's online. You go to... Lcatalytics or learningcatalytics.com, either one is fine. I want you to create a student account with sign up code demo. Instructor accounts are free, but it takes more time to set an instructor account up. So just, just set up a student account and use the sign up code demo so that you don't have to pay. <laughs> and uh, then join session one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you can either pick your seat from the seat map, and I've just programmed that, that cordoned off part, or you can take the numbers on your, um, you can just enter a number, 605, and then capital D for Dwat, or capital G for Gauche. So 605D or 605G for, yours would be 605G, capital G. So, and if you're on, Help your neighbor get on, okay? And meet your neighbors, too, around you, because I'll make you talk to your neighbors. So go ahead. We'll, we'll stop a, a, a minute or so for everybody to get on.
Yes. Sign up code demo, D E M O. Let me see. Create an account. I have a sign up code. There. They connect to it all. But so I Combien d'étudiants est-ce qu'on a 12. On a combien de personnes 42. Donc j'attends encore quelques minutes. So to enter your seat, you can either pick it from the map, but then you have to count. You can say, pick my seat from the map. Or you can enter the number of the seat. And after that, the capital letter D or G for droite or gauche. Okay, we have about 30 people on. I'm going to give you a few more seconds here to get on. 30. And then we'll do a few questions. Now, I don't know what your backgrounds are. I'm, I'm assuming not everybody's a scientist like me. So I chose, you know, just a random set of uh, questions from different fields, from art history to literature to... In fact, I've put a little bit more emphasis on the humanities than on the sciences because I think that in the humanities, um, even though a lot of humanities is taught in a discussion mode, I think there's not much use of information technology and interactive teaching in the humanities. I'll go and solve the problem. So keep, keep getting on and explain to your neighbor how to get on in case he or she doesn't Anybody, anybody having problems? Raise your hand. OK, good. Good, yeah, I think everybody's on. So let's start with a question that does not involve any words at all. Well, involve words in the mind, but it's just a picture. And in case you're not on, I, I quickly summarize the instructions at the bottom. Go to learningcatalytics.com, create a student account with code demo, 
and then that's the ID of the session. So what you see here is a grainy picture of the island of Oahu, which is one of the islands of Hawaii. And it's taken from the space shuttle, so at 300 kilometers height. And that's why it's not very sharp. But if you look at the picture, there are clues, and especially if you're in you know, geology, geography, you can probably interpret those clues quite easily. But the clues, like the vegetation on the island, where the clouds form, and so on, tell you something <clears throat> about the directions, the direction, pardon me, singular, of the prevailing winds. So what I would like you to do is, the picture should be on your screen right now, I want you to put your finger on the screen and drag, well, you can't do that if you have a laptop, you have to use the trackpad, but drag an arrow in the direction you think is the direction of the prevailing uh, winds, and then after you've drawn that arrow, hit the submit button at the bottom. And you can change your, uh, your arrow if you don't like the arrow you've drawn. So go ahead. And then hit submit. Don't forget to hit submit. Um, just so you know, and I'm going to show that in, in just a little bit, what I see here is the question that you see, but then next to it, I, I see a little representation of that same thing with all of the arrows that you've drawn, drawn in. So if you've already actually drawn your arrow, I'll come in and show it to you. I'm giving away what the right direction is, but that doesn't matter. I'll show that, I'll, I'll project it in just a second. Notice that I'm not projecting anything there, right? I'm pushing the information to your screen. We could do this with a cellular connection outside. You can make a smart classroom instantly anywhere, as long as you have either a cellular or Wi-Fi internet connection. No projection needed anymore. At the beginning, when I started using it, I would also always project it. There's no reason to project it because it's right there on your screen. OK, so I'm going to stop delivery. Most, most of you have answered. And I'm going to show you the result on your screen right now. You can see all of the different uh, arrows that people have drawn. It'll, it, it should refresh um, by itself. Is it showing all the arrows or not? <laughs> not yet? You may have to hit re refresh. No. In case you don't, I'm going to project. Oh, where is it? Green is correct. Did I forget? Did I forget to load the browser here? Yeah. Okay. Does everybody see it or not? Okay. Good. Good. So basically, this is what you saw. You drew uh, an arrow on your screen. This is what I had at another workshop. Green is correct. It's the tolerance is a little bit low. I should make it a little bit larger. But anyway, this is not a real question used in in a classroom. I could have you talk to each other, convince one another of what the right and wrong answer is without showing this, of course, and, and uh, poll again. OK, here's an actual question from one of my physics classes. We have two, um, we have two mirrors, the, 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 the fat lines here, which are at a right angle, 90 degrees. And there's a ray of light coming in. This ray is going to bounce off this mirror, and then it's going to bounce off that mirror, and it's going to travel in some direction after bouncing twice. I asked the students what that direction is. I used to have a multiple choice question where I would draw the correct answer, which is straight back, and I would draw some random incorrect answers. I don't know what students think. After we developed learning catalytics, I thought, let's just have the students draw the uh, direction. And this is what they draw. And you can see that there is a, actually a misconception by, held by a fairly large number of students thinking that the ray is going to not go straight back, but go down. I would not have been able to predict that. 
That's the problem, right? That's, in a sense, that's the curse of knowledge. When you're the expert, you can come up with the right answer, but you can no longer come up with plausible wrong answer because your mind doesn't work that way anymore. Here, there's no need to do it. The software does it. Then I ask them to turn to each other, convince each other, and you can see that yeah, they don't teach it that well. They go from 58% to 73%. Ideally, we'd, we'd have a slightly bigger improvement. There are still some students who are thinking it goes down. We certainly eliminated the few that think it's going to go up there. Yes. 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 We'll do that. We'll do that later, and we'll do one question like that <laughs> today. Okay. Yes. Maybe it has a little bit too high tolerance. But the thing is, on the small devices, even if you mean to do it horizontally, it might go off a little bit. So I think you need to have a little bit of, of tolerance there. I mean, certainly, and I've noticed that this is definitely true with text-based question, you do not get 100% accuracy in your evaluation of those questions. But that doesn't matter, because even with the clickers, you don't get 100% response rate. So you have no 100% accuracy there either. It's not about trying to give points to students. In fact, I would object. I would object to giving students points for the questions. This is formative assessment. It's not summative assessment. It's not to be used for evaluation. It's to be used as an opportunity to learn. You give points, and it completely changes the nature of everything, because now students are participating to get points, not to learn. Right? So if there's not 100% accuracy, if you, if, you, if you want to assign points, there better be 100% accuracy, or students are going to revolt. Right? But if it's an opportunity to learn, then the 100% accuracy doesn't matter. Yes? I beg your pardon? The answers are not anonymous. They're not anonymous. Because, don't forget, you logged in. I know exactly, you know, I can go, I can go on a map here. Um, I, 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 I can, um, I can, uh, let's do it if you don't object to it. You don't? Okay. I'm going to reveal your answer to everybody. <laughs> you don't mind me doing that? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So, that's not the window I want. I want this window here. So, I can actually click on this little button which shows the seat map. Right? Now, um, what is the front and what is the back? Is that you? Or am I? Yeah, it should be. 634D. Well, anyway, so you can, see, you can see all the different arrows that have been drawn by the different people. Right? See? And their names. And if you had linked your Facebook profile, I'd have, <laughs> I'd have, I'd have your picture too. So they're not anonymous, which means, which is actually very good, because that means when a student comes to my office, I can actually review their answers and, and, and you know, help diagnose their misunderstandings. Also, after the session is over, you can review your own answers. You can log back in and review what you've done. Yeah. OK. All right, so let's do, we'll get back to the seat map and what it allows you to do in, in, in just a little bit. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Thank you for asking. See, I mean, this, this is the perfect demonstration of why the method works, right? Because it creates a desire to wanting to know the right answer and as well as the reasoning. You know, this, this um, I was telling Aryan, um, this yesterday. Earlier this summer, I read a book with the title, Who Owns the Learning? by Alan November. Great book. And it starts in the preface by asking the question, did you ever experience something that completely changed the way you were thinking about something? And I think we all have moments that we experience like that. And then he describes something that happened for him 
when he was a high school teacher in the early 80s in Lexington, Massachusetts, which is not very far from where I live and work. And he describes, he was a high school teacher and he was responsible for the computer classroom. At that time, there were not many PCs. It was still you know, an expensive piece of equipment. The, the high school had a computer classroom. And on a Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, the police calls him. There had been a break-in in the school, and they asked him to come and, you know, to the high school. So he's not very happy. He gets stressed. You know, it's his Sunday morning. He, he's, he's got to go to the school. He gets to the computer classroom, notices that there are no windows broken, no doors forced open, no computers missing. There's just one strange thing. There's a student sitting at one of the computers. So he goes to the student and he says, Gary, what are you doing here? And Gary says, I want to learn how to program the computer. And that's when he realized, if people really want to learn, they'll do anything. Right? They'll break into a school. You want to know the answer to this question. You've taken ownership of the learning of this field, which is not my field, so I'm not even sure I can really explain it to you. What he did was, rather than punishing the student, he said to the student, why don't you take the computer home? In a month, he had, pro he had taught himself Pascal programming, and he then used his skills that he had developed in Pascal programming to address weaknesses he had in mathematics by programming how to plot functions and so on. Back to this question. I don't want to... I don't want you to be awake tonight in bed thinking, why did I get that direction wrong? Well, there are several things. First of all, you can see that the clouds form right at the peak of these mountains on the northern side of Oahu. You can also see that they dump their, most of their water right on this side. You can also see actually a wake here, just like as if you had a, a ship going through the water. Now I've exhausted all my knowledge about, uh, about, uh, about this subject, so. <laughs> Okay, but thank you for asking that because it shows, you know, that, that even though I'm not here to teach you geology uh, or geography, it's easy to awaken people's desire to wanting to know. So I'm afraid I cannot completely satisfy that desire today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but hopefully a lot of that gets resolved in the discussion between the students also, right? I mean, the idea is that all, most of that, if not all, gets resolved in the discussion. We'll do one such question, but we can't do it with every question because I won't be able to show you the different modalities here. Okay, so let's go to art history. Here's a painting by uh, Sassetta, which obviously shows a Madonna and it has four saints. And I want you to point out which one is St. John the Baptist. No, unfortunately, you cannot blow it up, I think. I had to find a painting where it didn't actually have the name of the saints underneath. I can put it on the big screen. Oh, no, I cannot put it. Oh, quickly hide this. There we go. Let's see if I can. Uh, unfortunately, that's the biggest I have. But I can blow it up this way. Is that better? Okay, so some of you are just having fun here. <laughs> some of you are pulling my leg here. <laughs> okay, so press on, on, on the person representing that and then hit submit. If you, do you have to put sub, submit on this type of question? I forgot. Yeah. You do, yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you the results now. Here, we'll, we'll have another one. There we go. And notice that every single living person in that painting was chosen by 
someone. <laughs> here is the, here are the different choices. So you can see the, you know, I think this is St. Michael. No, St. Nicholas, St. Michael. Certainly not the Christ. And I forgot who the, St. Diana, I think, is on the, far, uh, on the far left. Anyway, so that's a very different type of question. You can ask for identification of you know, images. Uh, I have uh, a number of instructors who are using this in biology to show you know, uh, parts of uh, identifications of cells and networks. I mean, I, I was looking around yesterday in the types of questions that the different instructors in different fields are coming up with. It's amazing. I mean, you can use this in, in lots of uh, different fields. You know, we can use that same modality to do something very different. Let me actually add a, a question. We're going to create a new question. Here, I'm going to do it. You know, in longer workshops, what I do is I make everybody an instructor, and then I have different people create questions. I'm going to create a question for you. At the top are the different types of questions. Um, I'm going to take this type of question, a region question, and um, we're going to make it here. Where are you from? And I'm going to take a map from Switzerland, which I uh, downloaded yesterday here. There we go. So it loads that image. And uh, of course, there is no right answer to this question. Well, the right answer is that where you are coming from, but I mean, there's no generally right answer. So if there were a right answer, I could say, let's say that only the people from Zurich are. Where is Zurich here? Somewhere here, right? No? Uh-oh, I got it wrong already. Where is it written? Oh, there we go. Right, so I could actually select an area here like this. Or I could select several areas. I could say Zurich and Lausanne. Oops, pardon me, that's not right. Clear. Clear. So let's say Zurich would be one area that's correct here. And then I add another region, Lausanne. Anybody who's not from Lausanne or Zurich, my apologies. There we go. OK. So now we have that question here, where are you from? I save this. And I'm going to deliver that question. It's number 10 here. Deliver it. So you can, uh, you should see it on your screen here. You select the city you're from. There, somebody from Geneva. Lausanne, Yverdon. No, no, you have to only do a dot. You can only do a dot. Same, same, uh, same engine, if you want, as the, the previous uh, one. I would, of course, not project this window. This is the instructor window that I typically have on my, uh, on my iPad. Okay, we can, see, we can see individual responses by going to the seat map and you know, see where people have clicked by just hovering over, over, the, over the seats. Okay, good. So when I uh, stop delivery and when I say show all results, it actually comes to your, uh, to, to your screen. Yes? No, so, 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 so I should not have selected any boxes, right? That way every dot would have been red rather than green and, and red boxes because, of course, there is no correct answer here. Yeah. But I just wanted to demonstrate how I did that for other ones. Okay, so let me show you a few other modalities first without actually trying it out, and then, and then, and then we'll, we'll try it out again. Here, for example, you know, it says sketch a graph of the function fx equals x minus 3 in parentheses square plus 2. You get that on your screen. You just draw a function. And as the instructor, I can see every single function drawn by the students. Right now, we do not score that yet. What Brian learned for his PhD thesis is still, we're still in the process of doing that. 
So, they, so if you have 200 answers, you get 200 little graphs. Uh, but there's a way that I will illustrate in a minute to, uh, to quickly get a feeling for whether or not people get the right uh, answers. Here, this is the function fx equals the logarithm of x. Sketch a graph of the derivative of this function. Well, you get it on your screen, you, you draw it, and then as the instructor, you can see the different. This is from an actual class, a high school class, rather than a, hmm? Yeah. So you can actually see the different answers, and you can immediately identify some mistakes that have been made by a number of the, uh, of the students. It also has a mathematical back end, which means that you can enter functions. And it's smart. In other words, it knows that if the correct answer is, let's say, A divided by B, that 2A divided by 2B is also correct. Or that A squared divided by A times B is also correct. So it actually parses the mathematics. Or if the answer is 2, open parenthesis, A plus B, close parenthesis, if people write 2B plus A, it's also right. Or 2A plus 2B, it's also correct. So it actually is able to parse the mathematics. Let's do a very simple um, example of that. I have to find the question. I had another art history question, but I'll skip that one here. So if 2 times x minus y is equal to 4, we're going back to algebra here, then x is equal to and you may want to you may want to test the system by you know instead of giving the answer multiply it by some factor and then dividing it back right Okay, so another minute or so. I have so please enter enter your answers. People have been very creative in coming up with many contorted ways of expressing the correct answer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show everybody here. Stop delivery. Show all results. Again, you know, we have not done any peer instruction here now. So don't, don't think this is peer instruction. Right? The only thing I'm doing is demonstrating different, different ways of different questioning modes. We'll get to the peer instruction part. OK, so notice that 64% has the right answer. And um, that the right answer has been expressed into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ways, all being counted as equivalent. Okay, any questions about it? It does trigonometric functions, square roots, you, you name it. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So if you capitalize, um, uh, for example, the, the second incorrect response is correct if you make an equivalence between capital and lowercase. Now, the problem is that in physics, you, the, the capitalization is very important because there are simply not enough symbols 
and therefore little v, for example, is velocity, big V is volume, and sometimes those two appear at the same time. So that's why we decided to make it case sensitive. So the person who entered that, capital Y divided by two plus two, would be really upset if this were, you know, counting for, for points, but, you know, it's not. And also, now you know for the next time. There won't be a next time because I'm going to switch to another, another uh, entry. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so you can also use it to take data. And it's especially interesting both in a psychology class or in a statistics class. We're going to do something really trivial here. Um, for example, in the next uh, question, I'm asking you to enter your height in centimeters. I tried that in the US. People have no idea what centimeters are. Feet, OK, but not centimeters. And. Um, what it basically does, it analyzes the statistics of distribution right away. So thirty another twenty seconds here. In fact I can show the results as they come in. And you can see the mean, the standard deviation, the range, and the distribution bind very roughly and automatically bent. Do you see it? Is it on, on the screen? And it should, as, as more people enter their answers, it, uh, it should update. So it's a way of actually doing an experiment. I sometimes, I didn't want to do it here because it gets messy, do things with coin tosses, right? I have uh, a large class and I have them flip a coin six times and then uh, enter how many times they got ahead and you get a nice Gaussian distribution, you know, even with a relatively small number of, uh, of, uh, of students. You can use that same type of questioning. Okay, back to graphs. And this is the last one that I just demonstrated. After that, we'll do an actual peer instruction question. So this one here is a little story. Sarah rides her bike to a friend's house which is, op which is half a mile from her home. A straight road along which she rides at a steady speed leads her from her home to her friend. The trip takes five minutes. She stayed at her friend's house for five minutes, then walks back home at half the speed she had on her bike. Sketch her position as a function of time on the graph below and it assumes that you know her home is at zero, position zero, and that she starts at time t equals zero. So you 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 sketch you know with your finger, and you can have more than one segment, and then hit submit at the end. And I'm sorry, I'm making you all work hard on a, on a Friday morning here. <laughs> Usually we do. overlays them so you can see when people deviate from <laughs> I can tell you <laughs> okay so we got about half the responses in I did this workshop in Latin America. It was in, in um, Chile a few weeks ago. One person drew a bike. <laughs> <laughs> 
So let me show you what people have, uh, have drawn here. So what it does, it overlays all of the different graphs on top of one another. And that permits you to see that most people got it right, but there are some people who have uh, different answers. And one, yeah, random walk too. But you can sort of, you can pick up the misconceptions at once from this graph. Yes? I can. You can. You can. Yeah. You, you can, but in the case with the, with the qualitative graphs, you, you can't overlay them. Be, right? This one is numerical, so therefore the correct ones, there's only one way of drawing a correct one. If it's just a parabola and there's no numbering, you can't. Was, was the one that, 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 the first one I had. Right. But, but the derivative, for example, it would not have been possible because it's more qualitative than quantitative. This one, it would not be possible, right? I mean, this one I would count correct, that one I would count correct, this one perhaps, right? Okay, I, in fact, I'm gonna do one more question before we get to peer instruction, and that is uh, a text base, because I wanna show that, you know, this is not only good for sciences or art history, but it can also be used with purely text-based uh, questions. So here is a, um, is a little poem and, uh, by Stephen Crane. I want you to read that poem. Did I send it? There we go. Um, and um, I would like you to read that poem and then highlight the line that you feel has the strongest imagery visual imagery and hit submit after highlighting the line. So I put on the screen an example. This is different, this is a piece of Shakespeare. It's not the same poem, but you, know, you should be able to highlight it that way and then hit submit. Not able to select? Huh? Oh, maybe I misprogrammed that one. Anyway, this, this is what should have been happening. I, that's, that's, that's the problem when you, when you put these questions together when you're jet lagged at 11 o'clock in the evening. But basically, here's a little uh, piece of, it's not the one that you have on your screen. It's a, it's a little sonnet from Shakespeare. You, you know, the students highlight whichever sentence they select. And as an instructor, you see a heat map. The ones that have been selected the most show up the brightest. The ones that are selected less show up less. I'm sorry, I don't know why this doesn't work here. Okay, so that's a quick illustration of the different, and not all of them, because there are more, of some of the different types of questions that, that we have available. We're right now putting the data analytics on the back end. See, this is another problem in education. A lot of the data, education is probably, an, uh, a sector of uh, human activity that creates an incredible amount of data, right? Because we continuously assess our students, we give them exams, we grade their work, but then we throw all those data away. In fact, they usually don't even survive from one year to another with the same instructor. There are very few instructors who actually take the time of documenting their grading of different problems so that they can go back and reevaluate it. Because this is all in the cloud. All the data resides in the cloud. Every time you gave an answer to any of those questions, the data gets stored together with that question. And if somebody else uses that same uh, question, we can compare 
the aggregate data selected from it. So we can actually put a back end on it that does analytics on all of those data. So let's say you're teaching a class and you're trying a certain question on your class. Data comes back. We know how your students have done on that question. We can go through the database and say, hey, here are some other questions that might work for your class because instructors who have used that same question in their class have also had success with this question. So we can do some collaborative filtering the same way you have on Amazon or other online shopping, right? You shop for something and then it says people who have bought this item have also, or also, and, and often it's eerie. You think, wow, how, how can they know this about me that I might be interested in this? So we want, by that mechanism, make it possible, and we're just starting to implement that, uh, for instructors to uh, get access to better questions in the classroom. But let's get back to peer instruction because the important part of peer instruction is the human interaction. I already alluded to that uh, earlier. How am I doing on time? We have another 15 minutes, perfect. So here's a multiple choice question from actually one of my classes in one of my physics classes, electromagnetism, you know, the pre and the post distribution. And as I've uh, briefly shown you before, you can click on, uh, on this little icon and see the distribution of answers. This is the pre and here is the post. And as you can see in the post, there's still some clusters of students who have the wrong answer. And when we started doing that, I thought, you know, what we really should do is we should let the system manage the pairing, right? Rather than telling students, turn to your neighbor and, and you know, choose just a random person, why not have the system manage the pairing? So, you know, it can just make the pairings, either two groups of two or groups of three. So now what happens is that it'll show the question, and at the bottom it will say, please discuss your response with Brian Lukoff to your left. Want to try it? So this time we're going to do a real peer instruction question. And I hope you all enter the correct seat, otherwise, you know, it's not going to know where you really are, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to send you a question. This is one, um, actually, it's a little bit hard. It'll make you think. It has to do with statistics and probability. And what I want is that you first answer the question individually. I know some of you are sharing, um, so you'll count as one person. <laughs> so don't talk to your neighbor. Think about it. It doesn't matter. Don't worry if you get it wrong. It, it really doesn't matter, right? But think about it yourself without talking to your neighbor. Enter it. And then at some point, your device will say, talk to this or that person. Not talk. You know. So there we go. Here's the question. A meteorologist predicts a 40% 40 40 chance of rain in London and a 70% chance in Chicago. That question cannot be right, right? I thought it always rained in London. <laughs> what is the most likely outcome? Okay, so please enter your answers. If you don't know by now, just make it a guess. It doesn't matter. But do answer it. And it will try to pair you with somebody who's either to your left, to your right, even across the gap, in front or behind. Not diagonally. And I'm going to put you in pairs rather than in three. Or maybe I'll do it in three. Let's do it that way. Um, we have 37 responses. I guess that's OK. So I'm going to make groups of three. And um, there we go. 
So now you will see on your screen to whom you should talk. So, so it might be somebody you don't know. See this as an opportunity to meet somebody. Go ahead. We got some pretty heated discussions here. It's good. Keep going. Why do you think I've repaired you? <laughs> uh. So be sure. But we're almost done.
I'm delighted to see the level of animation here. There are some quite heated discussions. However, the time, the clock is ticking. So I would like you to wrap up your discussions. You get another minute, but then answer it again. Even if you have not changed your mind, answer it again. You don't change your mind. You're entitled to not change in your mind. <laughs> so another 40 seconds. Okay, 20 seconds. <coughs> And um, I'm dying to show you these results. So I think everybody has answered here. 38. OK, I'm going to show you the results. Stop delivery, show all the results. Now, the initial percentage of correct responses was 39%. That's low. That means, you know, one out of every three, roughly, right? And and if you have a question where only a third gets it correct and you let students pair themselves, it's very difficult for them to improve because you know mostly they'll be talking to other people who have the wrong answer. But lo look at what happened. The correct number of percentage went up to 63, which is you know quite good. A lot of learning took place. And I know many of you are dying to know why it's answer D and not B. But we don't have really time. So We'll, we'll do that over coffee, OK? Let me show you some preliminary data. Here, oh, this is not random pairing. This should be saying students selected pairing, because it's, of course, not random at all. It's students selected pairing, self-selected pairing. This is the percentage of students changing their answer who are initially incorrect. That's what you want. You want those to change. And those who are initially correct. You do not want those to change. Probably these are students who are either not very confident of their answer or who have just been guessing the first time around. Depending on the algorithm, we can improve that difference very significantly. This is still very preliminary data. We haven't published it yet. We're still in the process of collecting data. But it just shows that if you don't control that pairing, if you just let the students select it, you do not have the optimum uh, configuration. The algorithm could be, do you force there to always be a correct answer in there? That's not what I did with you. I only said the answer had to be different. This, is, this algorithm always includes a correct answer. This one just says two different answers, even if none of them is correct. In, this ca in both cases, yeah, yeah. But of course, these are not exactly the same questions, right? Because we can't do the same question twice because the previous exposure will change the answers to the second one. So they're, they're different questions, and therefore, you know, each represents about 10 different questions. Um, so I would not place a lot of value in any of the absolute values. It's the differential that matters. OK. Good question. Very, uh, right. very good. But you know, that, that's a self-correcting process, right? I mean, suppose you're sta sitting next to me. I, got a, I choose A. You choose A. But then, but then you know, the questions are not in isolation, it's one after the other. So if I'm wrong, if I talk you into A, but it's actually B, when the professor shows the distribution and says uh, B is the correct answer, or a, what is it? I talk you into A, and B is the right answer, you'll go, C, I was right, and I will go, oops, you know. So my confidence will go down, your confidence will go up. So it's a self correcting process, actually. That is a self but one of the things that we're doing is that we have several classrooms at Harvard now equipped with 
microphones at every chair, and we have high-definition cameras that videotape every single student in the classroom. It was not easy to get IRB approval for that study. I was, that was, it was a lot harder to get IRB approval than to get the students' participation. In this age of Facebook, clearly privacy means nothing. Uh, we, we gave them the forms because they can opt out of the study, and 92% um, participated. And 85% gave permission to use the video in conferences. I can show you some of the video if you're interested. But basically what we're doing is I work with a, a colleague in computer science who, so that we can do machine-based posture. Uh, first of all, it, it does facial recognition. So it knows, oh, this person is there, that person is there. But then it starts tracking posture. So it knows when the student is facing up, down, left, right. And it also looks at the gesticulation of the hands. So we, we actually can look at the posture to determine the engagement. And then if we see some inter interesting interaction, we can press a button, and then we hear what the students say in that group. So I have, you know, we have a whole, hmm? Does it, include it includes sleeping. But let me tell you, in an interactively taught class, there's not much opportunity to sleep. There's not much opportunity to, to be on Facebook or on email or on Twitter or anything else because you're using the device for something else. If I lecture, screens go up, Facebook, New York Times, you know, you name it. If I start using learning analytics or anything else, learning analytics is on the screen. In a sense, you're hijacking the device of the student. <laughs> Last little bit. Um, what about time management? So I, I talked about questioning. I talked about managing the discussion. What about timing, right? And, 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 and the whole decision tree. The decision tree that I developed when I did it with clickers or by hand was as follows. You know, I speak, I question, I have a poll. If more than 70% have it correct, it doesn't make much sense to have them talk to each other, right? Because most of them already have the right answer. So I explain, I repeat. If less than 30% have it right, it doesn't make much sense to talk to each other because there are not enough students who know it. I abort and start over again. This is the ideal cutoff point. Now, normally when I teach, I have to look at the screen. How many percent? How many percent? You can let learning analytics take that decision based on percentage and on geographical distribution. So it can take the decision whether or not the question is one where it's valuable to have the students talk to each other. Autopilot. The other thing is, how long do you give the students to think between these two steps, and how long do you give them to discuss? Clickers have a timer, two minutes, or one minute, or one and a half minute. But the timer is the same for all questions. Some questions take longer than others. So you find yourself always running to the computer, oh, let's add a little bit more time. Or if you have too much time, the students will think, enter their answer, pull up their email, because you know, otherwise they're just sitting there doing nothing. Or if they're talking to each other, they'll start talking about something else, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> we found that the curves at which the answers come in follow a, a, a behavior that can be modeled with questions that are easy, the right answers and the incorrect answers come in at different rates. Very interesting. If you look at the answers coming in, in the beginning, they're all right. You can see the fast students who have mastered the concept quickly answer it. And then later with time, there are more incorrect answers coming up. You can model that. And we can, after 20% of the answers are in, predict when 80% of the answers will be in with pretty high accuracy. So what we do now is once about 50% of the answers are in, we do an inverse timer. So we, we basically start on the devices of the students a countdown timer, encouraging, rather than you know having me to continuously monitor the answers coming in. It's done automatically. So that helps with time management. No time to, to demonstrate that, but you can imagine how that, uh, how that would work. Um, so let's do one more fun little thing here, and then I'll conclude. And I noticed that I'm going five minutes over, but we started a little bit late. so. I hope that's all right. <laughs> um, this question here, what's happening here? 
Which question is it? Um, did I lose? Oh, I lost my internet connection. I lost my internet connection here. I'm going to use my... Uh, I want you to answer this question. I want you to enter a few words about thoughts you have about learning catalytics. Meanwhile, I'll get back on the internet here. I lost my Wi-Fi connection for some reason. You can use more than one word. You don't need to have only one. So in the absence of our, our um, statistical analysis of free text responses, which we have not implemented yet, we've uh, built in this ability to do I'm going to show it to you on your screen, a word cloud. And you can see some words. You, see, you can see a cloud of words appear with the size of the word re reflecting the, uh, the um, frequency of that word. I've used it in physics, actually, you know. For example, you know, what causes something, right? And then students just enter free text. It takes out all the articles like the and un and so on. And uh, it actually works quite well in getting with a few hundred students a reasonable idea of what it is that they're, uh, that they're entering. Okay, so in conclusion, I think, you know, it, it helps you implement a, a proven research pedagogy using consumer devices, which means you don't have to invest in an infrastructure of devices that are not going to be useful a number of years from now. It avoids the pitfalls of multiple choice assessment. It's really difficult to write good multiple choice questions. I see you shake yes. And we, we've, I was at your workshop, which was great, in, in Denmark. Um, if you don't have multiple choice, it frees you to do so many more uh, uh, innovative, I think, and interesting uh, types of assessment. It also allows you to create a smart classroom anywhere. As I said, we could have done, we're, since I didn't project the questions, I push them to your device. I can, with my wireless device, walk around. It doesn't have to be an auditorium. It could be a flat studio classroom. It could be out in the cafeteria. It could be out in the grass provided there is some kind of wireless signal. So you can create a smart classroom absolutely anywhere. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your participation.